morning, everybody. How's the sound? <laughs> Thank you for this song, Natalie. That was, that was very good. So, based on the program, you might know that um, today I'm going to explore the phrase, we become what we think about. And this is something that I first heard um, on a YouTube recording from um, Earl Nightingale. And he recorded this uh, saying back in uh, 1957 for his uh, sales force. He was, a, he was a sales manager. I can't remember what he was selling, but um, he had studied uh, um, thoughts and um, success principles. And this was, uh, this was the phrase that got him to realize the truth of um, what it means to be successful. And he originally recorded it for his sales force, but it became so popular that um, it became the first gold record um, of the spoken word, and also the first spoken word record to sell a million copies. So when I first heard this, what I did was I printed it out in bold letters, and my wife can attain to this, and um, printed it out and put it in prominent places of our house, like in our bathroom and in my, uh, in my office, and also I had a little card in my wallet so that I could walk around and see, we become what we think about. Now it can also be a double-edged sword because I can walk in there if I'm feeling on the good side of things and go, yes, okay, I'll remember my goal, I'll remember my, uh, my dreams, and just overall remember to think positive thoughts, and that's nice. But if I walk in there and I'm not in the greatest of moods, I just look at it and go, yeah, yeah, I get it. <laughs> Let's move on. Um, but what it really forced me to do is, um, by seeing the words daily, it forced me to kind of dig in deep. And I did this, I would say, I don't know, about a year ago. I'm not really sure. But when um, I was asked to do this talk, it was just the first phrase that came to my mind. And so I wanted to um, share some of the things that I've learned about this along the way with you today. So the phrase, um, we become what we think about, was, the, was kind of the main um, uh, title or main idea of, um, of Earl Nightingale's talk, but one of the other things that I also will explore is the idea that um, confor conformity is the opposite of courage and that um, due to conformity a lot of times we give our thoughts up to um, others or other people's um, agendas. So also I'm going to work in several questions throughout this talk and the first one is, well how does this, we, we become what we think about, really work? Because as I was standing here earlier, I heard somebody say, well, if I think about a potato, will I become a potato? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> so it reminds me um, also of the saying um, from uh, Charles Hanel's Master Key System. This is something that was um, written by, it's like a home study course from the 1920s, if you're familiar with it. But in there it said, always the spiritual first, and then the illimitable and unlimited possibilities of achievement can follow. So this is a, another way of saying, first you get the idea and the thought, then comes the manifestation. Now it sounds a little simple, but what I want to explore in relation to this first is the idea of meditation. And what I discovered about meditation by doing it myself is that there's kind of definitely four ways that meditation can happen. And um, I think some people kind of think of meditation in different ways. The first is it's prayer whether it be gratitude or just asking for things that we might wish for. The second is concentration upon a given subject. And this can go uh, positively or negatively. We can concentrate on a subject for our, um, for our good, for our goals, or we can just dwell on something that's negative and it can kind of permeate us and make us attract more negative things. We can silently observe the myriad of thoughts that come through our mind. We're sitting silently and they just come, they just start um, coming in at you. Um, whether you thought them or somebody else told you, they just kind of come through. And then you can also be just completely silent. And this is where um, you just allow God to um, either speak to you or work within you. And so one of the things I discovered from trying these different types um, or just being quiet and seeing how my brain was working at the time was that you can guide your thoughts into um, higher uh, emotional vibrations. So if you have a thought that's um, kind of negative, you can bring it up. But what I discovered is you can't just take it from I'm totally depressed to, oh, I'm joyous and wonderful right now. There's kind of a, a stepladder process. 
And so um, one, of my, one of my favorite speakers I like to listen to a lot is uh, Les Brown. And one of the things he says is, our dreams come from God. And so we must quiet our mind to hear that still, small voice within. Now this is a good segue to um, another YouTube video that one of our community members presented to me after one of my last talks. And it's about a, um, it's about a young boy named Josiah, and he has autism, the nonverbal kind, so he can't, he can't communicate his, um, his desires or anything via words. And one day when he was about eight, um, he was given an iPad, and so now he was able to say, my favorite color is blue, my favorite food is lasagna, that kind of thing. But he started typing things that nobody had ever taught him before because all of his teachers and therapists are just trying to get him to say um, about what color this is or what shape this is. He starts typing things like, faith is flying a kite on a windless day. And one night he woke his mother up, and I don't know if I mentioned this, but um, Gina Riffle was the community member that um, showed me this video. Um, and he, he said, I want to tell, Mom, I want to tell you about the triune nature of God, which is also like the Trinity. And his mother said in the video, we have no idea where he got this from. We asked him, and he said, Jesus taught me. And so he first types in, the Father is the manager, the Son is the lover of operations, and the Holy Spirit is the worker. And so she kind of said, can you clarify that a little bit, make it a little more simple? <laughs> and he said, okay. The Father thought it, the Son loved it, and the Holy Spirit carried out the plan. That sounds real simple, but so, so what do we do? We just, we just um, love this idea and poof, there it is. That doesn't seem to, to work. There, there has to be a little bit more to it than that. But overall, it's a, it's a beautiful, um, it's a, it's a beautiful version of uh, the Trinity that we've come to know. So uh, Charles Fillmore um, is the um, co-founder of Unity, and he has uh, some insight into this from his essay, The Law That Governs Manifestation and Supply, and he said, when imagination and will work together, all things are possible for man. And further, he went on to say, that it is the childlike king or the childlike mind that finds the kingdom, and he um, obviously got this from one of Jesus' sayings in the Bible. And so I took this to mean, when when you're into your imagination, you're imagining things that aren't necessarily possible to your conscious mind. You reach to the impossible. Maybe you kind of put things together to make possibilities, or just ultimately there are things that are possible that that God can accomplish with you. And so your imagination helps to touch deeper into God, and then the will by carrying out, by going about your day with the will that you can accomplish anything that you and God set out to accomplish. The Holy Spirit works in um, works out there for you while you're just um, you know going out about uh, with your faith. So I'm thinking about this, and it makes sense. It's starting to make sense. Um, but what about um, the thoughts that have been put there by others? You know, we're, we're programmed from, from the time we're children, you know, in schools and television, and I'll get into the myriad of other things that we get programmed now. But um, one of the things I've struggled with um, in this become, become what we think about is in relation to money or abundance, you know. And so that was one I really wanted to dig deeper on and share. Because we've heard the saying, as the twig is bent, so the tree grows, or the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, you know, those kinds of things. And so um, when I was younger, um, my mother decided to make the decision to um, work as a waitress in a bar, and that started off a chain of events that um, there was always alcohol around the house, and then that turned into heavy drugs and different men and things like that. And so from the time I was a kid to the time I moved out when I was 16, our whole life was full of, um, it was just full of lack everywhere. I always heard things like, we can't afford this, um, we don't have the money, and we were on welfare the whole time. And so my programming was that of, um, of like a welfare type lifestyle. And so I, I, asked, I asked God, I said, how do I, how do I overcome this? Because 
I've demonstrated this will become what we think about in many ways, and I've actually demonstrated it in, in monetary ways um, by carrying around a hundred dollar bill in my wallet and seeing when I was um, working as a um, working as a um, at a restaurant um, that tips came more freely when I had a hundred dollars that I did that I could spend but didn't spend, and um, it allowed me to accumulate more money. But that's a, that's another that's another talk. So. Um, what I found was in this book, and my wife gave this to me in the midst of this month while I was um, really focusing on what we, we become, what we think about, and it's um, by Esther and uh, Jerry Hicks. It's the teachings of Abraham, ask and it is given. This book is absolutely amazing. The first thing um, I want to point out is on one of the pages it has a it has a list of 1 to 22, and it's like an emotional chart. So it goes from joy at the top to fear at the bottom. And all in between is all the emotions in between. And so if you, if you, um, if you have a thought, for example, this morning I was feeling frustration that I wasn't going to be able to do this, but I kind of brought it back up to um, contentment, and now I'm getting a little more excited and passionate about it. So this is working. <laughs> but... Um, but what she talks about is we have emotional set points. And she gave the perfect example to go along with the lack that I was talking about is that we have emotion, habitual emotional set patterns that we do. And they just, oh, when you hear the same thing over and over and over again, they just become that pattern. And so when you think about things like money, that's where you automatically go. And so if you have fear of money, when you think of it, you go to fear. And, and so... Um, what you can what you can do about it is um, is you can raise your vibration slowly. You can't just go okay. I automatically believe that um, I I have joy about money. I have joy about this. It's going to come. You have to kind of raise your vibration slowly because those are um, those grooves are worn deep into your brain. And um, so that was really good news. You can actually raise it by bringing, by bringing that up to the service and recognizing, okay, I feel this way about it, so let's try to raise it up um, a level in our, in our thought process. And one thing that I also realized is that you got to be careful not to place blame because um, as I've grown older, I realized that sometimes I thought, well, you know, I was taught this way. Um, um, my mother made bad choices, therefore it affected my life, and I can put blame on her. But that doesn't do any good, because it takes away your personal power when you blame other people. And it doesn't allow you to make changes to your own um, emotional set point. And so what I think to do is we extract the lesson of, um, these, of um, these things that happened in our past, and know that some things were just essential to our growth. You know, we can't blame others for what happened. They're, they're growth points. We know that God works all things for good if we allow them to. And that um, it's better to, you know, use your freedom to choose your thoughts and how you feel about them. So, um, so I've um, consciously chose, and my mother's long past, so I've had a lot of time to think about and, and um, think a lot, a lot of things. Um, about our life and how she kind of left us early and what and her contribution but one thing she always did we always had food on the table and so that's a blessing we always um, but she always also taught me to stand for what is right and like stand for those that can't speak for themselves necessarily and I'm not really sure why she took that stand but it was just something she always told me so like from a very young age, I was always interested in the likes of um, Dr. King and, um, you know, Mahatma Gandhi as he led the, um, the, in, the Indians out of British rule. Um, and uh, Abraham Lincoln, we all know what, what he accomplished. And of course, uh, Jesus. And I remember one time when I was in elementary school, this kind of sums it up. I, I always wondered why I was like this. Um, I was walking home and there was, a, um, there was a crowd of kids gathered around a park and that usually means there's a fight, you know. And so I went in and I saw that the kid that I lived with across the street was fighting some other kid. But um, normally I would go with the kid that lived across the street, but he was fighting a third grader and the kid across the street was a sixth grader and he was like a foot taller than him. And so immediately I wanted to help the third grader and I just jumped, kind of pushed him out of the way and said, pick on somebody your own size. And I proceeded to get in a fight with the sixth grader. And, um, but, but it, 
it showed me it, sh it shows me now that I've um, I've always taken causes um, kind of seriously, and um, there's a lot of causes you can get involved in, such as um, you know save the trees and the environment, a very good cause. Um, help save the oceans and the marine life from all the oil spills and plastic and things like that. Um, and there's so many causes, you know, there's people that are um, e eating horses. I mean, there's, there's, there's causes for, for just about everything, but I never found one that really jumped out and said, yes, this is a cause that you need to go all in on until about a year or so ago. Now, my son was diagnosed with um, autism spectrum disorder, as many of you may know, and um, immediately we decided, my wife and I decided that we were going to be an advocate for our son, that we were going to learn and we were going to research about this and that we weren't just going to take everything at face value because as soon as this happened, it was like the whole world turned on us and started telling us what to do as if everybody else knew what the best thing for our son was. And so, so we had to learn about all the therapies that are out there and um, all the options and it's kind of an exhausting thing and to be honest, um, our, our BS meter went up many times on a lot of things that we were told. And so, and also to be also truthfully honest, we've become very sickened by a lot of the stuff that we found because the, the premise of the main um, therapies that are out there are based on compliance and conformity. And as I learned from Earl Nightingale, conformity is the opposite of courage. And so um, we decided that what his, he just has a different um, brain than us and that by treating his behaviors, we're not really going after the cause, we're just rearranging effects. And um, we've also found that others that are um, autistic um, have said that these therapies have done irreparable damage to their self-esteem, to their confidence, and ultimately to their sense of well-being, who they are trying to make them be somebody else because the whole idea is to get them to be normal. And so, um, but how, so what does this um, have to do with, um, what does this have to do with who we become what we think about? Well, I'm glad you asked because stuff like this is around us all the time. Um, what we found is it, it kind of, it, it's like, it's a propaganda machine, okay? And so, the, um, everywhere you go, there's people that are trying to get you to do or believe in what they believe. And so they, they think that um, they're right, what they have, and you know, if you're working, say, um, for a specific, like for example, if you're a, a therapist working for autism, then you obviously believe in your choice, so you're gonna think that what you're doing is right, so you're gonna tell everybody else with passion that what you're doing is right. But all around us, we see these societal influences on our thinking, and with the example of autism, it's easy to see why um, a uh, therapy that is, has been denounced by some of the famous autistics as, um, as you know, kind of dehum dehumanizing and, um, and um, helps and takes people away from um, their self-esteem that the reason it happened is because parents are so fearful of having a, an abnormal child or having a child that is different or having a child that um, won't be able to play sports or won't be able to do music or won't be able to do all these things or that people will, will talk bad about that they're almost willing to do anything to, um, to help and um, it's been capitalized on in this way and with um, some of these therapies that um, are quoted as, you know, being the only evidence-based one, or um, and also they don't even have a 50% track rate of being successful, but it's all that's out there. So, um, from a young age, we are filled with things that other people want us to learn. In school, now it's going back to three years old, um, kids in preschool, they're, be, they're, they're being taught things, and some of it's really good reading, ABC, um, but a lot of it is just a matter of what um, some agency or a few people decided what the whole curriculum would be. And so, um, so, as we're, so when, when we're trying to change our own thoughts, we have to recognize that we have been filled with um, these thoughts from a young kid, and some of them 
we may not recognize that they're, they're impacting um, some of our thoughts today. Um, some of the examples we see are, um, like I already kind of explained, um, medical propaganda. There's medical propaganda everywhere. I mean, every time you turn on a television, there's an ad for a new drug, um, a new miracle drug with a thousand side effects. Um, there's government propaganda um, every day. Um, there is, uh, so now we have social media to add to it where um, people are mic dropping after, after dropping their uh, opinions on social media and um, all, all it seems to me that they've done is regurgitate what they heard on TV somewhere. And then you have the, uh, you have the media that um, is obviously sensationalizes things with headlines to get your attention. And so these things can also affect our thoughts and get us riled up. Um, it's all competing for our ba brain space, which is why the meditation piece is so important for you just to connect, let those things go, and then, you know, after you meditate, you kind of might feel a little bit different about them. Um, but and, to make it simple, all these thoughts um, take away from what God and we desire for ourselves. So what do we do with so much competition for our brain space? Well, first, know that we cannot change the world. Um, we can only change ourselves, and we can attract to us what, is, what we're um, thinking about and what we're vibrating on. And also, um, it's a good time to remember what Jesus said about when you... Um, before you try to take the uh, speck out of someone else's eye, take the plank out of your own eye. Second, the best thing to do is to enter the kingdom like a little child with imagination and wonder and just know that God can um, reach your mind and reach you through ways that you can't even fathom. I know this is hard to do if you're kind of wallowing on the, the negative side of the emotional scale. Um, I've experienced that. Um, quite a bit. I'm sure everybody does. I think we all kind of go in, go in waves. Um, one thing Les Brown said that just came to my mind is just remember that this has not come to stay. This has come to pass. Um, third, remember all things work for uh, good in God's kingdom. Something might look terrible to you, but it might wind up being good for somebody else. It might just be a lesson, but ultimately we put the stamp of emotion on it. Some things you can't help but put a negative emotion on. You know, a family member dies. Um, but a lot of things we put, we over-emotionalize that what happen on a daily basis. And we put, um, we, and we do this both ways. You know, we, we make it sound a lot better than it is or we make it sound a lot worse than it is. And so the, the main thing is, is we can control our emotions and what we, um, and how we react to events and um, thoughts that occur in our brain. And we can also use, we can use affirmations to do this, and Unity teaches um, about the affirmations to help lift these um, emotional vibrations where needed. And um, it's good to remember what little Josiah said in the video, um, that if you have faith, if you go out there in faith, that the Holy Spirit is always at work. Um, I want to... Before I um, give you kind of a, maybe a little a simple exercise that might help, I want to um, sum it up with something Les Brown said that really, really stuck with me. If you don't program your mind, someone is going to program it for you. Now, uh, for the simple exercise, came from this, again, Ask and It Is Given, fantastic book. If you want to dig deeper into how your thoughts um, affect your uh, reality and how you can... Um, how you can kind of guide them and um, change them to uh, fit you, is that you find a, qu find a quiet place and meditate. Be comfortable. You don't have to worry about perfect posture, none of that stuff. But just be quiet, be comfortable, and um, be alert because it's easy to get comfortable and fall asleep. I've done that many times. <laughs> but um, this is the one that I felt has worked for me the best, and it's uh, focus on your breath. And that's easy to say because you start focusing on your breath and thoughts start coming in. But this is what I did that kept me focused for um, like 10 to 15 minutes on nothing but my breath, which is, which is obviously the life of God. And so when you breathe in, just count one. Breathe out, say God. 
or whatever, if you want to say something different like source or something like that. But I do one in, God out. Two in, God out. And that keeps me focused on God. And anything that comes into my mind, I, I just, it's, I'm releasing it to God in the process. And it, and it helps, helps make me feel better. I've only been able to try this a few times. I just found it recently. But um, it does make me feel much better. And I just wanted to share at least that with you. It's real simple to do. And um, Abraham, in this book, uh, or Esther and Jerry say, they, they've um, over and over and over again talk about um, we just... Our good is out there waiting for us. We just don't allow it. And that is one of the ways that she was able, both of them were able to allow it in their lives was just by simple breathing. And then once they figured that out, they did that every day without fail for less than a year. And then things started to change for them. And so um, the last thought is that you're, um, you can um, just remember that your, emo your thoughts um, are basically governed by your emotional responses to them and that um, they, they can be changed. They don't have to be where they are set. Thank you very much for coming and I hope you guys enjoy the Super Bowl this afternoon.